Okay, good day. So we're going to talk about expected mean squares today. A little subtitle here, did you design an untestable experiment? So this is why we do this kind of stuff in our experimental planning stages, not afterwards, <clears throat> because uh, it is possible to design experiments that are, are in fact untestable. That would not be good, would it? So today we're going to revisit the um, video uh, experiment that I talked about in video 38 and the, the basic problem is over here on the left we've designed an experiment where the source of variation potential source of variation would be ecotype so we planted each of two ecotypes uh, in growth chambers set at different co2 levels we're going to assume that all the differences between the growth chambers are due to the co2 levels we have planted them in trays um, that are nested within CO2 level. And we have uh, both ecotypes in every tray as well as in every CO2 level. So we can cross ecotype cross CO2 and we can cross ecotype cross tray within CO2. So it's a slightly complicated design and this would be our list of effects of course we don't list the error term when we're listing effects in our model but um, we also talked about how the fact that ecotype would be a fixed effect co2 would be considered fixed generally tray would be random because um, it just is and then we have fixed effects uh, we have a random effect which is a fixed cross for the random of course error is always random Okay, so what are we trying to do here with our expected mean squares calculations? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine the proper error term. Because remember, when we do F-tests, we're always doing a mean square ratio. And we have a numerator and a denominator. And we want the numerator to contain the, the effect that we're wanting to test, whatever that is, right? And we want the denominator to contain everything else except that effect. So the difference between the two is we're asking whether the numerator is inflated relative to the denominator and what is the probability of getting that much inflation. Okay, so um, what we're doing here is we're determining what are the proper error terms for ecotype. And as soon as we have some nesting going on uh, and no longer just straight fixed effects, uh, the error term is not necessarily error. So I've I put these in order from main effects down to nested effects and higher order effects as we go down. And what we're going to do is start out by um, kind of giving a shorthand for the row effect. And um, if it's a fixed effect, I'm going to call it kappa squared and put the subscript for um, how I'm giving a shorthand to ecotype here. And so we have kappa squared, we have two fixed effects for ecotype and CO2. Then we have, uh, I'm going to call it sigma squared for tray within CO2 because that's random. And then we have kappa squared for um, ecotype cross CO2. And I'm not going to bother writing the cross there. Um, then I have sigma squared for um, the ecotype cross tray within CO2 interaction. And finally, of course, it's sigma squared. We could put replicate within E, T, within C, if we wanted to make a really long term, or we could just call it sigma squared. Okay, so well, let's just make it by convention say that we're going to call the error term uh, sigma squared. And it really does have all these subscripts, but um, that doesn't matter because the error term is going to be part of the expected mean square of all of the terms above. So for now, we're just going to put that all in there. All right, so um, let me draw some lines to make this a little bit easier to see here. Oof. Because we're going to be transferring mean squares across here. And I want you to be able to kind of line them up. Okay, so I didn't do such a great job here. There we go. All right, so um, what we do is consider whether to move this term over here. Obviously, this is the row effect, so we will move that into here. And it is expected that the ecotype cross tray interaction will be part of that variance, obviously, in the numerator. And we can see then that we're going to test, and when we do our F test, we're going to test 
this term over this term when we when we go to test this source of variation. Very simple, right? Because this has just one more variance term than the error mean square, and so that's the proper ratio we want to look at. So what we're doing is we're going to looking for that proper ratio. Um, now we can consider moving up this variance term if it contains at least all of the effects the row effect has. Let me repeat that. So we consider moving this up, this sigma squared et e cross t within c, if it contains at least all of the effects the row effect has. So does it contain e within c? Yes, it has e and c. So we move it up. We may get rid of it later, but for now, we consider whether to keep it or not. e t within c, does it contain t within c? Yes. And we can actually see that ET within C contains all of these, so we're going to put it everywhere, at least to consider whether that might be part of the expected mean squares for that term. All right. Now, <clears throat> um, we also obviously have to have the row effect in for E cross C, ecotype cross CO2 level. Um, now, what about this one? Well, first of all, we, we never move up uh, the kappa squares. Kappa squares are not random effects, right? So we wouldn't consider them as part of a, a factor up above. So we don't include that. But for here with our tray, we obviously are going to include that in the expected mean square. Now, when we move up one more row, we're going to include the kappa square for CO2, obviously. But do we move this one up? Does this contain at least all of the effects the row effect has? C? Yes, it does have C. It has more than that, but that's okay. We move it up anyway. It can have more, but it has to have at least that much. Um, now we move up to the next row. Okay, so we're going to put the kappa squared E here, obviously. But we want to consider, do we move up this plus sigma square um, T within C? Does it contain E? No, it doesn't have it. So we don't, we don't consider moving that up. We do not move that one up. In fact, um, just to be super clear, I'm going to erase that right there. Okay, we don't move that up. All right, good. Now, so these are the candidates for keeping. Now we need to actually look at these interior sigma square values and ask whether to keep them or not. Now we always keep the error, and we always keep the final row effect, because obviously those are part of the variances. But what about these internal ones? So here's the way we find out. We cover up, first of all, I wish there was an easy way to do this on uh, online, but we cover up whatever is in parentheses and any letters that are in the row effect. So we cover up E and we cover up C and we ask, are any of the uncovered letters fixed effects. Well, I wish there was a way to do this. Let me think here. All right. I'll just say I'm going to circle it. So we cover up uh, E because it's in the row effect. We cover up C and what's uncovered, if that's a fixed effect, we cross out that term. Well, it's not. It's tray. That's a random effect. So we're going to keep it. So we keep this one. All right. So let's try this again. We cover up T and C, because that's the row effect. And if any of the uncovered letters are fixed effects, we cross that term out. Well, the uncovered letter here would be E, right? And so that's a fixed effect. We cross that term out. That is not going to be part of the expected mean square for tray within CO2. Ooh, okay. We don't have any other interior terms here to consider, so let's move on up for the CO2 effect. We cover up the row effect which is C, and anything in parentheses, well, that is the row effect. If any of the uncovered letters are fixed effect, we cross that out. E is uncovered, and we therefore cross that out. All right? Okay. Now, here we cover up the row effect, E, and anything in parentheses, that's C. And if any of the uncovered letters, that would be T, are fixed effects, we cross it out. Ah, it's not a fixed effect, so we keep it. 
All right, so we keep, keep, and we keep this one. Looks like I skipped over one here, didn't I? Let's let's go to back to this one. Cover up the row of any letters in the row effect C. Anything in parentheses that's C. Ah, uh, T is the only uncovered letter. That is not a fixed effect, so we keep it. Okay, so these we have kept by our rule. These two we've crossed out because we covered up the row effect and anything in parentheses and there was in fact a fixed effect left there. Alright, so now we have our expected mean squares and we can find our appropriate error terms. Okay, because we kept this interior sigma square here, the appropriate error term that contains everything except the row effect is right here. So the E cross C term is tested over the E cross T within C term. Ah. All right, how about this one? How about the tray itself? It's going to be tested because we crossed this out. It's going to be tested over the error term. So I'm just drawing these arrows to show what term is used to test what. How about up here? Okay, so we have this interior term that was kept, but this one was crossed out. Oh, look, we have tray which can be used to test the CO2 effect. We kind of knew that, right? We have replicated trays within the CO2 treatment, so that ought to be the error term. Well, this is proving it here. How about ecotype? This one may be not so obvious. Ecotype is actually tested over ecotype cross tray within CO2. Hmm, all right, so who would have intuited this, um, maybe a statistician who's done this a million times, but I know if it was me, or maybe you, it's not necessarily obvious. Now I will want to, I do want to say this is Sheffet's convention for finding expected mean squares. It's used a lot by geneticists, it's used by um, others as well, um, but there are other conventions so your specific um, sp software uh, may not use this. And uh, you'll want to find out what convention it, do it does use because it's actually often uh, in complex models you'll be asked when you're having your paper reviewed um, what convention you used for calculating your expected mean squares. Um, so one way you can do that to make sure, and by the way, um, it is possible to design an experiment here which, where there would be no proper error term um, we're actually going to be going over some of those in class, but um, anyway, it is possible to do that. What I recommend doing uh, a lot of time is creating a dummy data set that's actually um, just like the one you're going to use, like the real one. Of course, it can be a keep it simple stupid data set with a replication of two. What you care about is, is it possible to actually test all of my terms when I set these interior terms up as random and for example tell jump okay go test this um, if I have a dummy data set that has replication within the bottom layer of this I should come out with p-values associated with f-tests that are constructed by jump and by the way when you look at the jump output you can see what was being used as error terms for what and, um, and I think it's for complicated designs, it's really important that you go through this before you actually carry out the experiment. Way too often, I see people coming to me afterwards with questions about, oh, can I test this effect? And it turns out to be the effect they're really interested in. For example, here, we're really interested in this ecotype by CO2 interaction, and we're testing it over the ecotype cross tray within CO2 interaction. And it's a good thing we have that error term. Um, it works out in this particular case. But I've designed a version of this experiment where we cannot test that ecotype by CO2 uh, interaction term, and that would be a bit of a disaster to spend huge amounts of money doing it and then find out, oh my gosh, I can't test the very term I'm interested in. Ah. So very important stuff. Um, do try to um, always do this process as part of your experimental planning, not after the fact. I can't say that often enough. All right, take care.